and um, I just want to um, uh, yeah, introduce myself. Thank you, Beck, for the introduction. I've uh, finished my PhD uh, relatively recently based in IET at the OU, which many of you will be familiar with. And um, uh, latterly, so this was never conceived as a piece of open research in the beginning, but now at the end of it, and now I've graduated, and here's me looking to take it further. Um, I think there's some really interesting ideas and possibilities for taking the conceptual theory that either the conceptual framework that I um, generated in my research forward in an open way. So that's when I've started to become a little bit more involved with GoGN and to become an expert and friend. So um, there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's a long story here because my PhD has taken, it's kind of gone over about six or seven years in the end. Um, and it's a very unusual one. It was action research, actually doing something, not just studying it, combined with theory building. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of try and do you a bit of a story, just just a float over the top, a very elegant float over the top of this story and um, float some ideas past you and uh, show you the OER that I've developed in order to potentially take this forward and um, just share some of, the, some of these ideas of something that wasn't, as I say, originally characterised as open and is now going to be. And um, interestingly, it's been accepted in the work that Rob's been coordinating for the Encore Plus um, project um, in the OER Innovation Showcase. So it's uh, scheduled to be published as part of that Encore Plus project. And um, finally, just very finally, uh, very many of you will know the lovely Karina Bosu, who is here with us today. Um, I can't see you, Karina, but I'm saying hi. And uh, she was my lead supervisor from halfway through my PhD when she came in and picked up the reins, which was absolutely wonderful. So hi, Karina. Um, so I'm um, I'm interfacing with your penguins. Here's here's the lovely penguins. And if you're thinking of doing theory building um, as a PhD, then um, you you do have to have quite a bit of courage about you, and maybe be the penguin on the end who's looking to dive off the comfortable iceberg and do a great big belly flop into the ocean and um, enter the world of theory building and generating your own conceptual framework. Um, rather than um, the other angle, which is to use an existing conceptual framework or make an incremental contribution to, to an existing one. So here's me being the um, elegant uh, penguin at the end, just about to, to um, mid-flight to jump off the edge. Um, Oh, whoopsie, sorry, just clicked twice there. Um, so I also like the reflections that you had on one of your publications because the work that you did, and when you do collaborative action research, it's very uh, reflective. So I love that reflection as well. It's uh, the work that, that we did was very much helping a group of disparate and geographically separated practitioners to um, get involved in a really knotty learning design and delivery problem here at the Open University in a live module um, and reflect with each other about it. So I've been reading, I haven't read it all, it's quite big, but I've been reading your open research handbook and just comparing what I've been doing with some of the ideas that you've got in there about theory building and particularly this idea of developing openness as a process of research. So it's just to sort of try and make the connections with the publications and the values and um, the material that you've got out there already. Um, and then uh, just to introduce myself just a little bit, um, just a very quick, ske quick sketch. This is a collage that I produced from a while ago. Um, so um, and anybody who's in the UK at the moment will see the words ICL and Fujitsu blaring out at them at the moment because that's uh, very much the centre of a big controversy in the UK at the moment about a big post office system. But I did used to work for, for ICL and Fujitsu. And um, then I gave up my full time job a long time ago and went to live an independent life. So I've, I've worked for myself for about 30 years and then did the PhD. 
and that work has straddled the UK and South Africa. I'm, I'm married to a South African and um, we were 15 years in South Africa and I did some work um, in Johannesburg and at the University of Pretoria um, and basically it's all contributing to what I call a portfolio life which I set up when I was about 30. Um, I did a master's in business from my business school and started out my interface with the OU um, doing a um, course called H800 from Johannesburg and then followed that up when I came back to the UK doing a master's in research skills and a PhD. So I've done an in interesting project at, as I say at University of Pretoria which is all um, developing on my experience, my professional experience which is in, it's actually in this business of getting together people, groups of people to learn how to improve whatever it is they're doing. So it's collaborative quality improvement and enhancement in technology based contexts which they're on the left. Um, that's what I do for my business. And then I've done research on the back towards the end of my life. I haven't been to my PhD. So the headlines of the project, as I said, it's born from my previous experience. Um, and we did it in a live year, oh, year two in the middle, sandwiched in the middle of the degree, chemistry live module. And the question is, can we use all of this technology that we've got nowadays that we use for academic learning or professional development, can we use that to connect ourselves together to learn about complicated, difficult, knotty, challenging, wicked problems? And we actually did it. So I wasn't like interviewing and then deciding what possibly might be done. We actually did do it in a live chemistry module, uh, which was suffering from um, recruit, uh, sorry, not recruitment, retention and progression problems, and particularly volume and pace of material and preparedness of the students and these kind of issues. But you'll know in the OU and in so many different situations now, all the different practitioners are spread and across different contexts and boundaries um, and they don't necessarily get to speak to each other. So can you use the technology to pull them all together, put everybody's heads together to figure out what's going on and identify the issues, decide what to do and do it, try it, experiment and then evaluate. So that's what we did. So it's an unfolding collaborative action research process. And you'll see up there on the top right hand side, there's a DNA piece of clip art. And that's a very good analogy for an unfolding process. OK, and there's a thread of that that goes through the work. Um, so that's the headlines about it. We actually did it. And we did manage to put everybody's heads together and we did come out with some interesting solutions which did help towards the development of the module. And then I conceptualised it along the way. So once I've conceptualised it, then for a particular context, the next stage is to take it further um, and to apply it to other contexts. OK, so when you're doing all of this and you've got all of these different practitioners involved in a complex, knotty problem, you could say that you're involved in a process of organisational learning. It's not academic learning. It's not individual professional development in the minds of single people. It's a group of people coming together to collaboratively learn about something. And so this, the notion of collaborative of organisational learning is um, tends to sit in the management and organisation studies discipline. So I ended up doing an interdisciplinary PhD on the top of everything else. And the um, definition that we used is called a process of individual and shared thought and action. So you can debate this for a long time about what the term organisational learning means, and I did that in my thesis, but this is the definition that we use. It's individual and shared thought and action where you're putting your heads together and deciding what to do about something which might be complex and fragmented and spread across a lot of different boundaries. So it was interdisciplinary. Um, I'm not going to go into this too too much. This is my interdisciplinary flower that I put in my thesis. 
but basically I'm using process and practice theory, network learning, organisational learning and development, and then on the methodol methodological side, I'm using grounded theory and collaborative action research. And as time went on, I became more and more involved with pragmatism and John Dewey. OK, and the guiding thought here is, as I've said now, is that practitioners need to learn how to improve in challenging and complex practical situations, because nobody usually has the entire view of everything. Everybody's got their little bit to play, their little part to play. So you need to learn about that and figure out what's going on and put it all together. So. Uh, we had a methodology which is called Technology Enabled Collaborative Action Research. Okay, and you're learning together in this unfolding and emergent process. Okay, and I used um, a model which is insider action research down here. It looks like a three legged milking stool. And it was originally written by a guy called David Coughlin, who's in Ireland, and Theresa Brannick. Um, so that's what we use because it means you're inside the um, situation and you're not studying it as a separate researcher, you're, you're within it, okay? And it means that you get joint ownership, discussion, action planning, implementation and evaluation. And then I underpin that by grounded theory method to underpin this collaborative process as it went along. I'm conceptualizing it as, as I go along, okay? Um, if anybody's into pragmatism um, or heard about pragmatism or trying to understand what philosophy to use for their PhD, then I got more and more into this. And there are there are lots of different perceptions about what pragmatism actually is. So um, the key things that we're going through is that you're looking as reality, you're understanding it as a continually unfolding process. And that gives you something called a becoming ontology um, in contrast to being where you're where you're studying static reality. It means the whole process is continually changing and unfolding and you are within it and in the moment. OK, um, and you can take account of emotion. Um, it's often driven by emotions like doubts, like there's something wrong and you don't know quite what. So you've got to figure it out and, and make a choice. And there's a transaction going on in between the organism and the environment. I'm a little organism sitting there, right? And something's happening to me. The environment has just changed. And I've got to figure out what it is and do something about it. So the process of thought and the taking of the action is one continuous process. And that's what pragmatism is all about after John Dewey, OK? So this is what helps you, and it's very commensurate with action research. Okay, so so this is just a slightly longer um, explanation of that, and it means that you're learning continuously how to react in your environment and how to solve problems. Okay, and that there's a special term in management and business studies called prehensive. Um, it means you're in from within, you're not outside, and you're in the flow of the unfolding process. Okay, so we did several action research cycles. I actually did three in three successive um, presentations of the module, which is three successive years of, of the module. So we had phase one and phase two a and phase 2b and i'm not going to go through this but you can see we just went through cycles of identifying issues planning action taking action and evaluating it and our issues particularly came out at pace and volume of material that the students were coping with which is a very common problem and student knowledge at the start of the pro of, of the module another very common problem because the ou is open and it doesn't have um, um, qualifications required for entry. So you can get issues with students being prepared for the level of study that they're at, okay? Certainly in a second year module, okay? So we did do go through all this action research. Um, at the end, we've got, we've got together remote tutors, we've got tut we've got who are spread, who are home based, they work from home. We've got together the module team and we're pulling them all together in a standard 
um, online technology discussion forum. We used the VLE site at, at the time, a special VLE site, um, and um, identified all the different problems and then the tutors suggested an intervention, which was something called a signposting intervention, which helped students navigate over what they identified as pressure point blocks, really conceptually difficult blocks and a lot of material in them. So the tutors identified and implemented this intervention called signposting. And then we evaluated it with the students and we did it, we did it using something called real-time student feedback. If anybody's ever heard of that, it's where you could put a questionnaire up in the live module planner for the module so that students can interact with it and realize that they're not the only ones struggling with this situation and realize there's an intervention and what to do about it. OK, I just see my video stops again, so I've just started it. I'm not quite sure how that long that's been off for, but here I am again, everyone. OK, so uh, then we did some project evaluation as well um, on the reflections of the really key people here are the tutors who have so much expertise um, and are sitting home based and are very keen to contribute that expertise towards teaching and learning challenges and then module reflections and reflections on wider transferability. And the, the tutors did understand that they were in this unfolding process, which, which empowered them to contribute their professional insight. OK, and then it did have a whole series of impacts um, for the module, including interventions. And then it was used, the evidence was used for something called the module midlife review in the OU. Um, they were empowered and they did feel as though they played a part together to be able to take a reflective step back into the module. Um, and um, they, they, benefit, they felt they benefited from that, but especially when it's benefiting the students which they're serving and they could see that their suggestions were being listened to. Um, and then students were benefited because they were actually getting what we call in the OU in presentation support. It's where you're actually doing something during the duration of the module um, rather than waiting until the following year when the student finished it. You're actually reacting to something within the module. OK, and it's now the whole module is being rewritten, incorporating the signposts as a learning design characteristic. So the lessons are being taken forward into the module rewrite. OK, so take a step back then. We did all of that. That's action research. But then as a PhD, I'm contributing to knowledge and not just to action. I'm not just literally do, doing a practical improvement job in the OU. Um, so I was conceptualizing all of that and I was using grounded theory to do it because, again, if anybody wants to ask any more questions, they can do. But within my research, I compared three different frameworks which are out there in the literature. Some of you may know of them already, all about executing or doing collaborative action for some purpose. And then I compared and contrasted them on a sort of great big uh, table with a series of 10 different aspects to justify that it was worth conceptualizing and the reasons why it was worth conceptualizing another one. Okay, and then use grounded theory to do the other one. So don't get scared everybody don't get scared but this is an example um diagram which i found quite useful about using grounded theory method in order to go all the way as they sometimes say and conceptualize a whole theory a complete theory and you can see the only method you need to take here is that it's iterative it goes round and round and round and it goes through a series of qualitative coding stages until you're getting more and more abstract. OK, so you start off with your open codes from your data and then you're making categories between them. And then you're identifying something called the core category. And that shows that pulls together the concept that you've got in, the, in your study, in your analysis. 
and you're showing how your other categories relate to it. And then you've pulled through finally with something called theoretical coding and make an integrated grounded theory. And it goes round and round and round and round and round iteratively using something called theoretic, theoretical sampling. You'll have to turn your heads around if you want to read that. And um, constant comparison. OK, because every time you get a new piece of data, you have to figure out whether it matches with one of your existing codes or categories or whether this should be a new one. And that's constant comparison. OK, so it goes round and round and round. And it's quite similar to action research in that sense, because you're just progressively uh, refining your conceptualization of, of your framework. OK, all right. So I just did two at once there again. So here we go, path to conceptualizing. Um, what I did, and this is just because I, I like doing this sort of thing and I love to think in diagrams, I'm a very diagram person, is I did it all on a spreadsheet. And so it, actually each one of these uh, colored boxes here is a code, is an open qualitative code. And you could actually even click on the link here where it says link in this spreadsheet and it will take you to all the pieces of data that I've coded to that code. So, and then I can I connect together or relate to all of my codes into categories. So this is all about different discussion strategies that were going on in the dialogue between all the different stakeholders. And then I had another category about AL, that's associate lecturer or tutor in the OU. So this is tutor experiences. I had another category about expectations and emotion. I had another category about how we refer to what's going on at the OU. So that's somebody referring to the way things are done and therefore potentially how they might be done differently. Um, I had another category about identification of issues. OK, so this is an intermediate step in the path to conceptualising. And then eventually, and this is eventually, like this takes quite a bit of working through, eventually you come out with a whole integrated framework. And this is it, it's called ULTIMATE, and it stands for Using Learning Technology in Making Action-Based Transformative Enhancement. Okay, so it's the ultimate framework, and this is here eventually. And in the middle, this is something called my core concept or core category. And I do know you talk about this in your research handbook. Okay. And then it is it has a set of categories, these colored ones, related to it by what are called theoretical codes or theoretical relationships. Okay, now I don't have time today, and I'm gonna like tire you all out to go through all this. But that gives you the essential nature of the sort of nuts and bolts of what a grounded theory looks like um, if you're operating um, on a core category and a set of related categories in grounded theory. And you're not, for example, using constructivist grounded theory, which is when you're interpreting, it's an interpretive way of looking at things. OK, so um, again, uh, anybody who knows anything about it will know that there's lots of different variants in grounded theory and that you have to navigate your way around them as a PhD student. All right. So I've got 400 pages of thesis on ORO, on Open Research Online. Um, and what I've actually done is release this as an OER um, with a CC license, as you can see there. Um, and it's literally five pages. <laughs> It's five pages down from 400, right? And I've put it in Oro um, to show people, just to, to share the and it, the worked example. This is the first one um, in an open university chemistry module, as I say. Um, and to, to give some clues, some ideas about what you might do if you want to take this forward and a series of FAQs uh, with it. So if you're if you are if you do have a complex knotty problem, it might be a learning design and delivery problem, it might be a policy implementation problem, um, it might be something to do with your PhD, then you could potentially follow this through just by following that link really um 
you know, quickly, it's available there. And just literally looking at five pages, which is what I put in as a sort of starter to get people started. But this presentation is all about possibilities and challenges. So there's this is an innovation and there's quite a few possibilities and challenges associated with it. OK, um, you do have I'm not going to read this. You can read it later if you want to. But you do need to have something called a high level theoretical storyline uh, with your theory, which so the other one is obviously just describing it, showing it as a diagram. This shows it as a series of theoretical propositions about what you mean when you're going through that collaborative action research process. So what does it mean and what does it get you at the end? Um, this this explains it in 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 text in English rather than as a diagram, and it's called a storyline. Okay, so there's the framework. Um, I do have a lamp post at the end of my road. I live just a lot just up from the Grand Union Canal in Milton Keynes in the UK, and amazingly, it wasn't me. I promise you. Somebody has, um, I don't know why, what does ultimate mean when, when you spray it on a lamppost? Somebody has sprayed the word ultimate on the lamppost at the bottom there. I don't know why. But of course, it's a lovely picture for me. So, so here it is at the bottom of the road. And then the whole idea is that you want to be able to extend this to a further level, to a longer level. Yes, Beck, I'm watching the time. So I'm trying to, I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, so, so you're taking it from your bounded context to different contexts, and that's where you, that's where you eventually move from a conceptual framework to a formal theory. Okay, and you do that. These are in the OER. You do that by looking at your initial categories and codes that I've done first, and then looking at your own situation and eventually thinking you're comparing you're going to be comparing do the codes that i analyze in my situation match up with the original ones in the ultimate framework or are they different but the ultimate framework is sort of giving you some scaffolding to get going on the process so i've done the first example for the first worked you know process all the way through OK, and what you'll be doing is something it's a scary term, but you'll be doing something called theoretical sampling in GTM. Don't worry, it's just a methodological, you know, jargon. Um, and then you're comparing to see how your codes that you analyze out um, compared to the ones, the initial ones that we've already got. And here's the DNA back again. Um, essentially, what this is doing is um, conceptualizing a blue thread here through the DNA, a blue process, which is supported by um, a red piece of learning technology infrastructure. And it's bringing in all the individuals that you need along the way. And this is just the example for the OU. You could have all your different types of practitioners um, involved, including students who are experts at, at, at being practitioners about learning. OK, so so this is just a an example to show how that unfolding process works. OK, and I even put it in a chemistry beaker because you've got all these different practitioners swilling around in the beaker and you just need to have a way to integrate them all together into a process and the technology infrastructure to figure out what to do. And the only time you're ever going to do it is if there's sufficient felt need for change and the problem is big enough to motivate action. So my analogy there was putting the heat under the Bunsen burner, right? That gives you your felt need for change, okay? So possibilities, possibilities, here we go, this is the end. You can, I could, contribute we can we can together contribute towards what the gogn says openness of a process of research by open theory building that means to extend the scope and reach of ultimate in a theoretically rigorous but open and equitable fashion empower people who don't necessarily know all this detail to be able to use it and then here's some key challenges here's some key challenges um, i'm looking at uh, investigating the use of open learn create to make a platform to do this one big challenge is getting some finance funding building confidence and helping people along 
um, as much as they need, whilst also maintaining the integrity and the rigour of the whole process. That That's it. OK, and then here's lots of um, references, which you can click through if you want to. OK. Thanks, Leslie, for the presentation. Really, really insightful. Um, um, OK. Hi, everyone. Um, just going to try to give you a quick tour of a little project that we've been working for for quite a while. Um, it's slowly progressing uh, because um, it's it's a field that keeps growing and growing and growing. Sometimes assessing information and trying to evaluate everything that comes every day uh, makes it quite hard. It's it's quite challenging at times. So my name is Javiera. I'm a senior lecturer in teaching enhancement at the University of Suffolk. And as I said, this is part of an exploratory work that, that we're conducting currently. The idea of this, this project is to focus on how we can better equip our fellow educators with critical perspectives on how they um, understand the ethical issues around algorithmic discrimination and anticipate to respond to challenges in regards to the use of AI for the development of OER. A bit of background, uh, for, for many, many years, I've been working in the open education domain, but also in the critical data literacy domain, doing quite a lot of work around developing um, data literacy, um, you, how to use open data, so you are, how to enable spaces and arenas for understanding critical issues in a data fight society. So in a way of an all this kind of an opportunity to merge both worlds in which I've been working on and also academic development, which is basically what I do for a living. If we think about what open education advocates for, on reducing barriers and access to participation, widening learning opportunities, democratizing education, and how OER has been described and presented to us, including in the latest declarations from UNESCO, is basically any materials that are freely available to use, adapt, and share. That sort of definition fits with AI-enabled or generated uh, resources in general, but the description of OER doesn't include yet the idea of AI-enabled OER. So artificial intelligence, um, generative artificial, artificial intelligence, um, give us an opportunity to experiment, to create, to adapt, to contextualize resources in all shapes of form, but there are plenty of risks implied in terms of environment, uh, labor, um, biases. So how are we gonna look into what the machine is creating for us and how we are assessing the impact of these open educational resources enabled or developed through, through um, AI? can have in us and can have in our students. So if we look at the ethical considerations, and this is, again, a part of, of, of the very, very um, initial work that we, we, we're doing, we consider that the development of AI-enabled OER needs to be designed with a lens of social justice and a lens of data justice, um, considering that whatever you do on the machine, can bring bias and discrimination because the data sets of where the infrastructure of, of their knowledge is, is, is grounded is already biased, is already um, misleading sometimes. So therefore, we need to consider that generative AI can amplify and perpetuate inequalities, reinforce discriminatory practices that we've been carrying out for a long, long time. So if we're going to start developing, consciously developing OER through AI, we need to consider elements of data justice, data ethics, to ensure that our OERs are representative um, and actually challenge power inequality and still keep amplifying them. If we understand a little bit how the machine works, the machine works through patterns. The machine learns through patterns. So if, and is trained by humans, um, normally those humans, um, working conditions are quite poor, quite appalling. Um, is they're underpaid workers working for big corporations that have an agenda, have a set of values and ethos. So basically they are training machines through systematic models of oppression. They are the clusters of data they are working with, 
comes with narratives, with histories, in, what, in the way that the history of humanity is being told by the powerful ones. So it's leaving behind and further discriminating and marginalizing um, divergent voices. If we look at the ecosystem of AI, we have our own human biases. We do have them. There is racism and sexism and transphobia in our culture. Therefore, there is discrimination, and we are feeding all these negative elements into the AI systems. We cannot say that we don't have any biases, because historically we do. And we keep perpetuating these discourses, this discourse of hegemonic power, of discrimination, of racism, um, sexism, you name it because they are all included in the way that society operates. The, full, the, the, the machine is learning from us. And the machine is learning also from people that it's underpaid, um, exploited. So basically they are told what data to input and they have no say in how the data and how to discriminate between potentially dangerous data and fair data. And this is a very interesting example. This is how redlining operated in the United States. If you ever heard about redlining, it's basically how segregation physically happened in the United States during, of course, um, after um, um, the, the end of slavery. People, Black people could only live in certain areas. They were only allowed to live in certain areas. Therefore, the maps of the cities were basically coded against who could live where. So that gave the zip code. That all data was inputted into, into the first IBM computers. So basically, the, the maps of the cities, how people perceive cities through computing, clearly said where people live, so where the Black people live, where the white people live. And of course, there is an income um, division, it's an income gap. Uh, and, 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 and there is, in the case of, of this very example, is, for example, if you, tend, if you currently live in an year which was redlined, um, you basically might have ended up paying high interest rates in your loans because the machine assumes and predicts that you have a lower income just because the computer system was framed that way. Um, again, if we look at biases in, in, in AI, it's, it's the world, the world where we live, uh, which we know it's currently quite tragic. Um, there is historical biases, representation biases, measurement biases, temporal biases, and um, omitted variable di uh, biases. We look at algorithmic evaluation and aggregation, popularity, emerging links, um, emerging biases and, and links. And of course, there should be an angle of human review on how we can mitigate those biases to make to take action on how we're going to mitigate all the baggage that we are carrying with us in we're bringing to the machine. So in the context of, of OER, I've asked today, um, I did a very small exercise and I've asked um, different um, uh, generative AI platforms to help me create an OER yeah, for childhood education students um, describing the main theories and theorists in, in, this, in a very simple table. If you see, this is what the machine outputs. So certainly, here's an open educational resources that presents an overview of the main theorist. Who are the key theorists? Can you spot a pattern here? We move forward, then again, I went to pink. And I've asked, it's like, hey, um, can you give me a list of the most influential theorists in education? Again, the pattern repeats. Can you see their images? So then I've asked them to make me an image, an image of um, the theorists. And this is what I got. Can you see another pattern in there? So if we don't develop or you're conscious of, in this case, which is pleasantly obvious, as gender bias and race bias, what are we creating? We are amplifying the dominant hegemonic discourse in education, where basically the theory that we work on and the approaches that we work on, it's just led by white influential males. So for me, 
the, the technicalities of developing the OER, I think it's been quite discussed. We, we know how to develop an OER. We know how to license an OER. Technically, we should know. Um, although when we start asking the machine to create an OER, if we don't apply our own judgment and we don't look into the biases and we don't look into um, how we are perpetuating and amplifying um, biases, discrimination, racism, and you name it, uh, we will end up with a bunch of resources that are harmful for our students. Um, um, Huang Egal have designed this framework about ethical issues of AI that basically covers <clears throat> a wide range of elements. So ethic issues, ethical issues at an individual level, it's about safety, privacy, freedom, autonomy, and dignity. Ethical issues at society level, um, for instance, justice, responsibility and accountability, transparency, certification, sur um, surveillance, democracy and civil rights, job replacement, human relationships. But there's also a component that is quite interesting here. is ethical issues at environmental level. Um, natural resources, use of energy, pollution and sustainability. So if we look in how we're going to develop OERs through AI, we also need to consider those three factors. This is my proposal, and this is a proposal that I've kind of been reflecting and thinking, how all these frameworks for data and data justice that I've been using quite a lot in my other side of the world in developing um, data literacy for, for academics can fit into helping my fellow academics, my fellow educators into um, developing ethical OERs through AI. And I really think that the uh, data, the framework of data feminism developing, developed by um, Catherine Dignacio and Lauren Klein fits quite nicely because they have several questions that we could be asking ourselves in terms of, okay, what are we going to do with the OERs that can be developed by AI? How are we going to audit them? How are we going to ensure that we have a process that can help us ensuring and mitigate to mitigate biases and to be inclusive in the in the ways that we develop OERs. So the first principle of, <clears throat> the, of data feminism is to examine power. So analyzing how power operates in the world. So we need to look, and I'm coming back to my image. How power is operating in the world? There, there is a graphic image. Challenge power. These are the dominant voices in, in education. How are we going to challenge that? How who I'm going to include in that portrait, in that picture that is not uh, portrayed? Maria Montessori, um, Bell Hooks, and there are lots of other women that we haven't included, and also international scholars. Elevate emotion and embodiment. Acknowledge um, that the knowledge that comes from people. Acknowledge um, in, in in when we when we ask when we design OER that. People live and is portrayed sometimes in, an, in unfair manners, depends on their own physicality. Therefore, we need to rethink the binaries and hierarchies in the society. Data feminism allows us to do that by challenging gender binarism and all the forms of counting and classification and clustering people to perpetrate oppression. Embrace pluralism. Um, so showcase that there are all the ways of knowing, all the knowledges that include indigenous experimental ways, community knowledge. Therefore, we need to consider the context in which we are operating. If we are teaching um, first year students in childhood education that these are the only people that have thought about education, we are basically taking off the ideas of representation. These people are not me. The people in the portrait are not me, clearly are not us. So therefore we need to consider the context and embed people that our students can relate to, and also make labor visible. Um, one of the things that we've been discussing and um, kind of, yeah, mostly discuss this discussions, conversations about making labor visible, because we already have the potential to keep acknowledging where the knowledge that we're gathering comes from through open licenses, so attribution. Here, the machine has been stealing work, it's been misusing, copyrighted work has been misusing information. So basically we don't have anyone to attribute. It's been powered by um, chat GPT. 
So in, in the sense of like how we could start thinking about developing um, OER, AI enabled OER um, through data feminism, we could ask simple questions. For example, who are the dominant voices in, in, in our OER, in the OER that we're developing? Who are the theories, who are the, the leaders, where the, um, the information comes from? Um, who's not mentioned? Who's invisible? How are we going to challenge the power structure? Um, how vulnerable groups are being represented or portrayed in your OER? Um, are we showcasing lived experiences? Are we making fair points of referencing or making portraits about, about people in marginalized communities? Um, is our OER reflecting diversity? Um, are we being inclusive in the way that we use our language? Um, are we representing all the um, all the means of knowledge? And this is, for example, quite interesting when you think about astronomy, which seems to be a very, very rigid um, discipline. Actually, it teaches us knowledge about astronomy and how the planet works. It's quite interesting. This is something that we can even represent in, in hard science. Indigenous knowledge is very important. So do we have a mitigation, a bias mitigation strategy in our development of OER through AI? Um, do we address unequal social uh, relationships? We do address elements of data and research ethics principles. Do we acknowledge issues about related with copyright breaches and misuse of works and the commons? Um, do we consider the exploitation of workers that have been feeding basically the machine? Of course, there are all the principles that we could be looking at when we think about how we're going to develop and enable OER through um, AI. There is the European Commission's Trustworthy um, AI guidelines that talk about human agency, um, this um, diversity, fairness, society, and environmental well being. Um, the UNESCO AI ethics framework in, that mentions inclusivity, inclusiveness, accountability, fairness, and privacy um, protection. The um, IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics and Autonomous Intelligence Systems that ensures the well-being of humanity, transparency and accountability, um, the asylum are principles of AI, so bro bro broadly distributing benefits and long-term safety, the Montreal Declaration of Responsible um, Development of Artificial Intelligence, so ensuring the well-being of the all stakeholders, avoid and minimize risk and harms, ensure um, fairness and justice in AI systems, making and data justice, which is basically the work that the data justice lab in Cardiff are doing, this make making visible community driven needs, challenges and strength, be representative of community and treat data in ways that promote community and self-determination. Part of the work that we've been doing with Leo, Christian and other people is, is about creating this framework for data literacy and critical data literacy that is actually quite applicable for, for OER development to ensure that we respect the privacy of the people that we are portraying, that we promote sovereignty and data ownership and actual ownership of knowledge. So if you're using indigenous knowledge, we promote it. Uh, we address biases, we promote fairness, we respect autonomy, and challenge power structures. So if we're going to be developing OERs in whatever discipline, we need to keep looking at, hey, how are we going to challenge the power structure and not keep, as I said previously, amplifying them? So yeah, some questions before uh, we start closing down um, that we can, we can ask ourselves. This is for reflection, for thinking. Am I familiar with the platforms I'm using? Um, have I thought about how others may be portrayed in my OER? Uh, are there any, uh, is there any other open resources that I could be manually remixing to mitigate the environmental impact of the overuse of AI? Am I enabled critical thinking and critical literacy through my OER? And I'm not acknowledging attributing others in my OER considering this information might have been collected does not come from spontaneous generation, but is basically data mining and gathering uh, knowledge that all the people have produced. So we need to keep the decision-making processes. Um, we need to be very aware of our own decision-making processes. We need to make sure that we understand the data, the algorithms, the modeling, and we decide at the end of the day, we make a conscious decision like whether we're going to use that resource, we're not going to use the resource, we're going to amend it, we're going to criticize it, we're going to look into it. But the outcome needs to be very, very rationalized. So yeah, um, 
and acknowledging and making labor visible. Um, this work comes from all the conversations that I have had in the last months, years, decades, you name it, with people like Anne-Marie, Leo, Chrissy, Lorna, Frances, Davor, Wayne, Priscilla, Ben, Catherine, Rob, and Danielle, and also saw the inspiration in the work of the Catherine Dignacio and Lauren Klein uh, on the um, data feminism and the data justice lab. So yeah, that's me. <laughs>